Panorama TV presents Digital Photography One-on-One, -on -One, where we answer your questions. Here's your host, Mark Wallace. Hi everybody, welcome to this week's episode of Digital Photography One-on-One. -on -One. I'm Mark Wallace. Well, this week we're going to be talking all about RAW files, and this started with a question from Jim Tihan. Would you please explain the difference between RAW and JPEG files and the advantages of both? Well, that's a great question, Jim. Let's start by talking about raw files and how they work. And we can sort of simplify this by talking about baking a cake. Now, I know this is a little bit of a tangent, but if you'll hang in there with me, this will make a lot of sense. So let's pretend for just a moment that we want to bake a cake. We're not quite sure how to do it, but we have our ingredients and we have a nifty recipe. Now the cool thing is, in our fantasy world here, we have all these ingredients and they're magic ingredients. And what I mean by that is we'll take our recipe, we'll take all the ingredients, our eggs and milk and flour and stuff, we'll mix them up and we'll put that cake in the oven and bake it. And when we take it out, we'll take a little taste and say, hmm, that tastes pretty good, but I'd like to change a few things, maybe a little bit more sugar, a little less eggs. And when we look over at our ingredients, well, guess what? They're still there, untouched, and we can use those again. So we take, we make a little modification to the recipe, we take the ingredients, we put them in a pan, we mix it up, throw it in the oven, pull it back out, take a little taste. Ah, we're pretty close, but we need to do it again. We look over, and guess what? There are all of our ingredients untouched. So we can keep doing that over and over and over again, making modifications to our recipe to make all kinds of different cakes. Now in the fantasy world, that'd be awesome because we could, like, I really like cakes, but in uh, the photography world, that's what raw files are like. You have the raw data, which is sort of like our, our, our ingredients, and then you have recipes, which are sort of like how we're processing those raw files to get many different types of uh, photos, black and white or color or highly saturated or desaturated, and you can do that over and over and over again. But the cool thing is the raw data, the ingredients that you use to create those different types of photos, they are never changed. You're always baking a cake and getting something different. It's really, really cool. Well, let's talk about how that works, and we'll compare that between how a JPEG file works compared to a RAW file. So inside our camera, we have this little digital one-hour photo. I'm sure if you were alive in the 70s and even the 80s, you remember going to those little booths and you'd drop your film off, and an hour later, there's your photos. Well, all that happens now inside of our camera, and so let's take a closer look at how it works. When you take a uh, picture, you press your shutter release, the first thing that happens is the sensor gathers all of the information, all the light, and converts it to a digital format, and that's saved as raw data. That's just all the basic data that comes into our camera. The next thing that happens is our camera looks at that and it says, is your camera set to take a photo of a, uh, save it as a raw for a photo or a JPEG photo? How are you going to save that file? So we're going to look at what happens when you use a JPEG file. So uh, if you have your camera set to JPEG, all the inside stuff that you have set on your camera, like white balance, like your contrast saturation, if you have it uh, set to maybe um, a CP or something like that, all of that is applied to the raw data, the sharpening, um, all that stuff happens inside your camera. The next thing that happens is your image is compressed. Now, depending on your settings, JPEG files can be either compressed really, really smashed down tight, and when that happens, you start getting some artifacts, some little blockiness to your images. You start seeing bands in transitions, like sunsets go from orange to a different, it looks almost posterized, so instead of a nice smooth gradient, you get these little chunks. Um, but if you have your compression set to like a fine compression, it has a nice gradient and it's not so bad. So that's up to you how your image is compressed. Well, after the image is compressed, that JPEG file is saved on your uh, compact flash card or SD card. It's saved in your uh, camera. And then the raw data is thrown away. So that raw data goes away. And it's sort of like taking the ingredients, all the eggs and stuff, and throwing them in the trash because you can't take those out. You just have the final product to work from. It would be like uh, in the 80s or 70s taking your digital art, your uh, negatives, um, and just throwing those out and just having the prints. So sometimes that's a good idea, especially if you're not going to be doing a lot of post-production. But if you are doing a lot of post-production, you really want those raw ingredients. So let's look at what happens when you shoot and you have your camera set to raw. Well, you uh, gather the information from your sensor. Your camera says, is this raw or JPEG? It knows it's raw. So what it does is it saves the metadata. 
Now, metadata is basically a recipe. It's like, it says, this is how your camera's white balance was set, and this is the saturation setting that your camera was set on. All the stuff that's over on this side, the image effects and the sharpening, all that's written down in the met metadata saying, use these settings when you process that raw file at a later time. It's just like a recipe. So the raw data is like our ingredients, and the metadata is like our recipe. Then the next thing that happens is that raw file is saved to your uh, CF card, the card that's inside your camera. And then you have to process all that stuff at a later time on a computer. In other words, you need an oven to bake your cake. And then the great thing about this is that the raw data is not thrown away. So you always have those ingredients to work from when you're uh, doing your stuff in post-production. So you can tweak things, you can convert it to black and white or back to color and back and forth. It's really, really nice. Um, so again, just as a summary, raw data, the raw file, it's all the data that's captured by your camera's image sensor with minimal in-camera processing applied. That's really, really neat. And in this sense, it's the uh, equivalent of a digital negative, and that's really, really powerful. Okay, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to switch over to Lightroom, and I'm going to show you uh, some shots that I took. And uh, we're going to look at a shot that I took both in um, RAW and JPEG. And the nice thing is on your camera, most cameras allow you to save an, uh, a file both as RAW and JPEG at the exact same time. And there are some big advantages to that. So let me go over here to uh, Lightroom really quick. And then we can see here are two photos that I took in New York City, and I took these uh, about a week ago. On the right-hand side, the black and white image, that is actually the JPEG image, and the color image on the left, that's the RAW file. Now again, on most cameras, you can tell your camera to shoot both RAW and JPEG at the same time, and that's what I've done here. So these are the exact same pictures, one processed as a JPEG, one left alone as a RAW file. Now you'll notice, if I click over here to this file, it is a black and white image. And because it's a JPEG image, it will always be a black and white image. I can't get any of the color back because it's been thrown away. It's gone. Well, if I go to the left-hand side over here, this is actually the RAW file. And you can see some big problems with this image. First, it's underexposed, and the color temperature is off. So I'm going to go in there and change a few things. So I can go into Lightroom to my Develop module. And the first thing I want to do is fix the exposure. And I can go in here, and I can tell this you know, make this exposure a little bit brighter. So I'm actually adjusting this by two stops. Now in a second, I'm going to show you some really interesting things about how RAW files store more information than JPEG files. So in post-production, you actually have more power for doing adjustments like this to say, I want to overexpose or underexpose, give me all the details that my camera captured. In RAW, you can do that. In JPEG, you're going to have some issues. So the second thing I want to do is I want to change the white balance. This has a really a blue uh, cast to it. So I'm going to go down here and just pick that right there. OK, now you can see that I've changed my color temperature and it looks much better. Um, then I can go in here and I can start playing with things. I can take the saturation up or down. I can make this black and white or really highly saturated. It's a lot of power in post-production that I can do to this image. It's really, really cool. If I go over again to the black and white image, I can pull some image data out of that, but I'm not really going to be able to change my color temperature as accurately as my raw data. Now, don't hear me saying that JPEG files aren't, uh, you don't, have the ability to do post-production with JPEG images. You do, you just don't have as much power when you're doing uh, JPEG images in post-production because things are handled a little bit differently. Specifically, white balance applied in post-production on a raw image is exactly the same as changing the white balance in the camera. Changing the white balance on a JPEG uh, image is actually adding some color cast to the image, so it's not quite the same thing, and you don't get as good of results. So there's a really quick example of some things I could do with the raw file. Here's another image uh, that I shot in Central Park. On the left is the raw file. On the right is the JPEG. And you'll notice right away that this file on the right, this JPEG image, once again, I shot that in black and white mode. And um, when I looked later at the RAW file, I thought, wow, this really has a lot of color to it. I'm glad I captured it in RAW because I really want to bring those out. Now, if I go to my develop setting, a couple things you'll see right off the bat. One, I can really bring up the vibrance of this so I can add a lot of color to it. 
I can take the exposure up just a little bit, so this is really starting to look good. Now there's a problem here up in the clouds, and that means that there's just too much blue in those clouds, and I don't like that. I really have a lot of control in post-production. I can actually click over here and say, take these blues, and I just want to take the blue down just a little bit. And you can see that those clouds have returned to a more natural looking state, but I still have a really nicely saturated greens in my image. And with raw processing, I can do all of that stuff. And so that's how it works in Adobe Lightroom. You can do a similar thing in Aperture or in Photoshop. You can have all this kind of uh, processing. Well, let me go back really quickly to um, our presentation that we had earlier, because there's something that is really important to understand. And that is these are these levels of light. So um, if we look on our chart here, there are really five different levels of light when you capture a photo in your uh, DSLR camera. We have about five stops of light from the darkest to the lightest. In the first f-stop -stop where we have the brightest tones, that's where the clouds are, highlights, things like that. With the JPEG file from the brightest bright to the darkest bright, there are only 69 steps. Uh, uh, or 69 levels of brightness. And with the raw file, there are 2,048 levels of brightness. Now that is a huge change. And what that means is in post-production, if you have some problems with, let's say, clouds, you have a lot more latitude for changing your exposure and fixing problems than you do with your JPEG files because there's just a lot more data there, almost 2,000 2, times as much. Now take a look here. In the darkest tones with the JPEG file, these are all the uh, shadows and dark tones where if you're doing um, some fine art stuff, you really want to tweak those to make sure that you've got some really amazing Ansel Adams type of shadows. Well, with the JPEG file, you only have about 20 levels from the darkest to the brightest dark. And with a RAW file, you have 128 levels, so you have a lot more latitude for uh, shooting with RAW files than you do in JPEG files. Well, now here's the other question that um, we need to address, and that is, what is best to shoot, either RAW files or JPEG files? Well, there are advantages and disadvantages to both. So let me just show you really quickly the uh, pros to JPEG shooting. First of all, they're really, really fast to shoot these guys. So you can shoot really fast. It's great for sport shooters. The compression is usually really, really good. It's going to have uh, really high quality photos. You don't have to edit these in post-production if you don't want to. So you can shoot a JPEG file, send it over to grandma, she can open it up on her computer, and instantly you've shared a file. So that's really, really nice. Now the cons are that image data is thrown away, so you don't have as much post-production uh, manipulation as you do with RAW files. Now with RAW files, the pro is that you have total post-production control, and if you're a studio shooter, a fine art shooter like I am, you really, really want that. The cons. Well, these images, these file sizes are huge. So usually you can only store about 25% as much on your uh, compact flash card as when you're shooting JPEG. And sometimes it's even less than that, depending on your compression settings on your JPEG files. The other thing is there's no universal file format. So Canon cameras have a different RAW file format than Nikon cameras, than Sony cameras, and a Leica. So some of them use digital negative DNG files, some of them use CR2 files and NEF files. So there's no standard. And sometimes when a new camera comes out, to edit those RAW files in Photoshop or Lightroom or Aperture, you can't until Adobe caps, uh, catches up or Apple with the right uh, software to actually look at those files. So uh, those of you who were early adopters of the Canon 5D Mark II are very aware of this, that when those RAW files came out, you couldn't edit in Photoshop for about a month or so until Adobe caught up and allowed you to do that. So that's a big con. So my uh, recommendation is if you're shooting photojournalism kind of stuff where you're not doing a lot of post-production, if you're shooting a lot of sports, fast action, things that you're not going to do post-production, stick with JPEG because that's really the answer for you. If you're shooting stuff that you know that you're going to do a lot of post-production work, if you're doing fine art stuff, or if you're using something that's going to be a, a large file, like maybe a bridal portrait or family portraits at a wedding, well, you might want to shoot that in RAW so that you can really get the maximum out of that image and uh, make a beautiful, beautiful portrait. And if you're not sure, you can always go into your camera and shoot both at the same time. And that also has some advantages, and that's what I do. What that allows you to do is, for clients, you can just give them the JPEG files and say, take a look at these. You can put it on a CD. The file sizes are really small. And then, once they choose the files that they want, go into the raw files and use those for editing and doing all your post-production. And when you do your final output, you have the best image sizes possible.
Well, I hope that clears things up. That is raw files versus JPEG files. And again, I recommend shooting both if you can. JPEG for sport, sport shooters, photojournalism supporters, and raw for people that really need post-production. Thanks for the question. And remember, if you have a question about photography or photography equipment, you can send those to me at askmark at adorama.com. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you again next week. This episode is brought to you by Adorama TV. Visit the Adorama Learning Center where you'll find photography tips and techniques, links to the gear used in this episode, and related videos. For all the latest photography, video, and computer gear, visit Adorama.com. And the next time you're in New York City, visit our store located on 18th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue.